Allora, buongiorno a tutti, grazie di essere qui con noi per questa conferenza stampa con Julian Moore per il film di Kids Are All Right. In realtà è da quando questo festival è nato che io, Piera De Tassis e Antonio Monda sognavamo, è stato da sempre uno dei primi nomi che abbiamo fatto, la possibilità di avere... La possibilità di avere con noi Giulia Moore, che è un'attrice che stimiamo tantissimo. Crediamo che sia un'attrice un che fonde modernità, ma anche la solidità di quelle grandi attrici del passato. Insomma, abbiamo sempre ammirato tantissimo. E l'idea che stasera, oggi, sia qui con noi, non solo per un bellissimo film che voi avete visto, e che tra l'altro è stata una grande sorpresa in America, credo che si chiami Sleeper, quei film che iniziano piano piano e poi si diffondono senza che, grazie al passaparola, alle recensioni, eccetera. Ma soprattutto per avere uno dei nostri primi maggiori, che sapete è Rapid Award, quindi dopo Sean Connery, dopo Sofia Loren, dopo Al Pacino, dopo Mary Strip, per noi è veramente un grandissimo, una grandissima soddisfazione, un grandissimo piacere poter avere lei qui con noi. Poi per qualunque domanda vogliate fare voglio solo dire che il film uscirà con la Red qui in Italia a febbraio, il titolo è praticamente identico, i ragazzi stanno bene. Vorrei solo fare una prima domanda, se me lo concedete anche un pochino scontata, eh, come si è preparata per questo ruolo un pochino anomalo nella sua carriera? Quali sono state le maggiori difficoltà o le maggiori sfide che ha dovuto affrontare? challenge with with anything actually is 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 making it real you know is making it um as true as possible i mean there there, there actually wasn't a whole lot of, of research per se because i mean you know basically i have a lot of experience about you know being in a relationship and being a parent which is kind of what this you know this movie is i mean it's it's an exploration of what it means to be kind of in life and be with a partner for a long time and feel like you're in a place where your life is changing and it's about kids growing up and defining themselves as, as um, different from their parents and yet staying connected. You know, it's really, it's, it's, they're very, very universal themes in, in the movie and I think that's what makes it so gratifying to watch and then also for me to play. Iniziamo quindi con le domande. Prego. Solo abbiamo dimenticato di fare un annuncio, ma in realtà, e lo facciamo anche da parte di La Fidel che ha portato il film in Italia. Il premiatore della signora Moore sarà Paolo Sorrentino oggi. Volevamo annunciarvelo che è il regista del vivo e che come sapete è appena rientrato dall'America dove ha appena terminato il suo film con Chopin. Scusatemi. Grazie, non posso dirlo, grazie Piera. Iniziamo quindi con le domande. Um, ho letto che il film è in parte la storia autobiografica del regista, volevo sapere se è vero e poi volevo sapere se in America una coppia, una, anzi una famiglia di questo tipo è una cosa um, così che rientra nella normalità perché sicuramente in Italia non solo non è normale ma anzi non sarebbe proprio possibile. Grazie. There, right there? There you are. Can't. Oh, there you are. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, I think that we are seeing more and more families, more and more homosexual families in the United States. I mean, uh, certainly with, for my children, we go to school in New York City and they know families where there are two moms or there are two dads. There was actually recently a study in the New York Times, on the front page of the New York Times, of, um, following gay families over the course of 24 years. And, and they basically kind of you know, charted the growth of these children and, and see, you know, see how they fared as, as adults. And what they found, and this was the first study done with gay families, that the children were well adjusted, they had been well educated, they were loved, desired, socially uh, adept. They were you know, basically you know, wonderful, in wonderful families and wonderful children. So, yes, I do think that families, homosexual families are more and more common in the United States um, and, and all over the world, frankly. Right? Buongiorno, sono Tagliaparica Sacro da Cinovano. Grazie. 
Grazie per questo film che è bellissimo, proprio bellissimo e mi ha fatto venire in mente un... Dunque sì, per lo meno le, le donne della mia generazione, eh, ma credo anche per quelle seguenti, hanno molto sofferto di, della sindrome di Biancaneve, cioè la, uh, i problemi con la madre, la competizione, la rivalità, tutto, tutto una, quella che va appunto sotto la sindrome eh, così denominata. Qui sembra che non ci sia, eppure ci sono due mamme. Mi chiedevo, ci avete pensato in qualche modo a questa cosa? Se è vero che poi questa sindrome si riesce a diluire, non diminuendo la mammità, ma anzi aumentandola in qualche modo. E poi rilanciavo anche la domanda della collega se è vero che c'è una parte autobiografica della regista. Se, eh, come è stato letto. Grazie. I'll address the issue of the autobiography first. Um, Lisa Chalodenko, at the time that she was writing this movie, was, um, was, really, was talking with her girlfriend, with her partner, about starting a family. And they were kind of trying to decide how to go about it, and they decided they were going to use a sperm donor. At the same time that she was starting to write this project, she ran into a friend of hers, Stuart Blumberg, who became her co-writer. And they just started talking about their work, and it turned out that Stuart himself had been a sperm donor in college. So they thought, you know, what, what, <laughs> what they, they both had experience on either side of it, and so started to write this movie. So yeah, I think Lisa, you know, I think this was an exploration of what that means, you know, um, for kids to grow up and, and, and wonder who their uh, biological father is. So it's sort of, um, yeah, it, start, it starts out with that thematically, but I also think it's, it's, it's really a meditation on what it is to be a family. And you know what a relationship is, and how do you, you know, how do you raise children? How do you let them go? You know, um, and you know, in response to this thing about the Snow White syndrome, I don't see that women in this case, the the, mo the mothers in this case, is being competitive with their children. Um, they're both, I think, remarkable, if flawed, parents. You know, these children are children that they love and have enjoyed raising and have kind of done their best with you know they're they're obviously smart and nice and caring um, so I don't know I mean I think we've proven again and again that that what children need are two loving parents I don't know whether it matters if they're moms or their dads or if they're a mom and a dad but I think if children have two parents that care about them they're in pretty great shape Hi, uh, Julian here, uh, Paolo from Portugal. Uh, I saw the film already a few months ago in, in uh, Berlin and I talked with Lisa and uh, she, she had the opportunity to say that it was, she wanted to portray a mainstream film about mainstream relationship. Of course, you've been in, in a lot of uh, relationships over the years in several films, but I wanted to ask you how much of a mainstream relationship you consider the one you had with uh, Annette Benning and with a uh, great performance that I think you Thank you very much. I think it's pretty darn mainstream. I really do. I don't think, I mean, I think the beauty of the film um, is that it's that very soon you forget that it's two women. It seems really like any, any relationship movie. And I said particularly, I mean, I think the thing that really strikes me about it too is that this is not, so often in film you have meetings of, movies about meeting someone. Who am I going to meet? Who am I going to marry? Who's, you know, I've got to fall in love and get married start a family. And then they do. And then at the end, and for those of us who've been married for any length of time, we barely remember that, <laughs> you know? That's something that happens like a flash. And then you spend a good portion of your life with that person, kind of exploring that relationship of raising children or what, you know, whatever. But, but that's sort of where the relationship takes place. And I think that's what's so wonderful about this movie, is that exploration of that and, and the very ordinariness of it. You know, you see where these women are successful, you see where they've failed, you see them let each other down, and then you, you, you also see this kind of incredible commitment, which I think is a wonderful thing. You know, Lisa's very, very positive about partnership, about, about marriage. Um, and I think it's a nice thing to see in this day and age where, where you know, people say, oh, you know, we don't, you know, we don't value that. But I think, I think many of us really do, and it's a, it's, it's great to see it in a film like this. Thank you.
Eh, io volevo sapere cosa ha imparato eh, su, su come, come si è posta il problema del tradimento, no? Cioè se lei ha in, come persona, essendo anche lei in una relazione da lungo tempo, e questo film parla comunque di, di, di un tradimento, come si è posta e come si pone lei la, cioè, rispetto al tradire no? in una lunga relazione. It was interesting. That's a very interesting question because um, obviously there were a lot of, you know, people talked about that, particularly after they saw the film, They're like, oh my gosh, you know, what, how did it happen? Why did she do that? You know, she's, um, Jules to me is so very lost. She's, you know, she's, she's been the one, she's been a stay-at-home parent for the last 18 years and her life is changing right before her eyes. Her oldest child is leaving, the second one's going to leave soon after that. She realizes she has to concentrate on her career, she doesn't know who she is, she feels, she doesn't feel seen, she doesn't feel validated, you know, everything she's used to define herself is slipping away. So she's just flailing around. Um, and what's interesting about the character is that it's not articulated. You know, a lot of times in movies you'll say, a character will say, this is my problem and I know why, and then they'll solve the problem. And she, like in life, just is, you see her kind of flaring up with their partner and, and thrashing around with job possibilities and then ends up running into this guy where she receives all this validation. So I thought, well, that's where, I mean, that's, that's where it happens. I don't think Jules sets out to cheat. I don't think, she, I don't think she's proud of herself that she did. She knows what she's done to her family and to her partner. Um, she's, she's sort of ashamed and, and has to be forgiven, obviously, in, in the movie, but um, it's more about her seeking a certain kind of um, validation at a time when she feels like she doesn't have any. And I think, I think that's one of the things that can happen. You can't, every, every case is individual, obviously. But what I found interesting about it too is that, you know, there's a tremendous amount of elasticity in love and in family and in partnership. Um, and to, to, um, to, to portray that was challenging and, and wonderful. Um, people are not as absolute, I think, in, in terms of their actions and their reactions um, in, in life as we think they are. And I think as you get older, you realize that. You realize there's lots of, there's lots of room for ambiguity, there's a tremendous amount of room for forgiveness. Um, um, so, so, yeah, I think that's all I have to say about it. <laughs> Hello, Julia. Uh, Julianne, uh, congratulations on the award that uh, you're receiving at this festival. Uh, congratulations for this film. Uh, and I just come from Australia last week where Chloe had opened and you were terrific in that as well. Um, can you tell us generally what has been a turning point in your career to date? Was there any particular time where you felt things really went upwards for you? Yeah, I mean... For me, it was interesting because in my 20s, I worked mostly in television and uh, in theater and, and, you know, and regional theater and off-off-Broadway and very kind of small things. And I would audition for movies, but I never really got them. Um, and then, at the very beginning of the 90s, I did a bunch of small movies uh, sort of back-to-back -back, and they all came out around the same time and they were um, safe, shortcuts, and buying on 42nd Street. And they came out within a year of each other, and and it was uh, suddenly I had a film career um, where I hadn't before. I mean, there really had been nothing. And so, so what happened to me was I sort of collided at a time with the independent film movement in the United States, and it changed absolutely everything for me. I don't know, I don't know that I would be a film actress necessarily. I mean, I certainly didn't get the parts, like I said, in, you know, um, when I was first starting out. So I'd say those three movies all at once really changed everything. Eh, buongiorno Giuliana, una domanda per te in questo senso, in questo film chi, è, chi esce peggio poi è il personaggio maschile, quindi l'uomo diciamo, abbiamo visto altri film in questa rassegna in cui il tema della paternità è centrale, questi padri che mancano, che non sanno fare il padre, in qualche modo possiamo farne a meno? Possiamo fare a meno dei padri? That's a really loaded question. Um, you know, I think, I mean, 
like I said before, when I address this, this question about families, I think I think whatever you choose to be, you know, your family is your family. And the, the interesting thing that Nick says to to Paul, you know, Paul so very much feels that this is his family, these are his children, and she says, no, this is my family, you know. Um, and what in, the difference is, he is their biological parent, but he has not put in the time. So you can't turn around and waltz into a child's life and say, I am your parent. Parenting is about time. Family is about time. It's about that investment. It's about having a, you know, having a little child and ushering them to adulthood. And that's the most important thing you can do for a child, whether you're a mother or a father, whatever. You know, I mean, that's really what your job is. <laughs> Uh, credo che questo film uh, sia contemporaneamente un film molto avanti, penso anche all'Italia, uh, ma anche, secondo me, anche un po' indietro. È molto avanti perché mostra come la famiglia è famiglia, anche quando sono due donne, quindi anche l'uomo genitorialità, come si dice, um, e questo è molto intelligente per il film. Il titolo, temevo, potesse insinuare che doveva dimostrare che i figli di una coppia di, di lesbiche bisogna dimostrare che fossero ok, non è quello il tema del film. La cosa che a me ha creato qualche perplessità è che il sesso fra le due donne viene mostrato di nascosto, sotto una coperta, complicato, meccanico, con un vibratore che non funziona mentre gli unici due rapporti sessuali spontanei, selvaggi, liberi, sono quelli etero, con il protagonista maschile che ha prima con la ragazza nera e poi con te. Sei d'accordo con questa mia lettura? Grazie. Um, let me see. First of all, I'll go just the all right question, the kids are all right. Lisa has a habit of calling everybody kids, like, hey kids, how you doing? You know, hey kids, let's go, to, let's go have dinner. Hey, she refers to everybody as kids. So that's kind of what she meant with the kids are all right. They're all all right. You know, that, that whole family's all right. I mean, in terms of the, the, your question about, um, oh, okay, uh-oh, uh-oh. Okay, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's not an issue of, of gay sex versus straight sex. It's an issue of married sex versus <laughs> not married sex. I think that's the point that Lisa's making, um, is that these women have been together for a long time and clearly they're experiencing some dysfunction in their relationship. Um, if things are going smoothly, I don't know that I don't know that Jules would have had the affair. Things are not going smoothly for Jules in her life, in her in her relationship. She feels disconnected in her you know in her work. She feels disconnected in her parenting. You know, so that's that's sort of what you're seeing in the film. So I don't really I don't think Lisa's making a, a point about gay sex versus straight sex. Well, well. Buongiorno, Luisa di Simone, rbcasting.com. Io volevo chiedere una cosa riagganciandomi anche alla domanda sul padre. E mi è sembrato in questo film, tra l'altro bellissimo e girato molto bene, che mancasse il punto di vista del ragazzino di 15 anni, nel senso che è sviluppato più il punto di vista della ragazzina che si affeziona a questo papà biologico e meno quello del ragazzino, quando sappiamo che per il ragazzino di 15 anni la figura proprio maschile e paterna con cui giocare è molto importante giocare con cui confrontarsi come, diciamo, come uomo, come papà, insomma, è molto importante. Mi è sembrato anche strano alla fine del film questo papà dalla finestra che sorride e il ragazzino che mh, lo ignora e, ed è strano perché io ho visto nella vita reale ragazzini di 15 anni che non hanno il papà e che darebbero oro per avere il papà um, comunque resta che comunque questa famiglia loro adorano il loro figlio però ecco mi, mancava che, mi sembrava che mancasse il punto di vista del ragazzino grazie i have to say that, I mean, if you remember from the very beginning of the film, the reason that Joni goes to look for their father is the urging of Laser. Joni's not interested in finding her father, it's Laser who's interested in finding his father. So he's the one who starts the journey because he does want that. He wants to know. And 
I think it's actually interesting and kind of complicated from Laser's perspective because you see him want to engage with this man and then find out how opposite they are. You know, every time, every time he says, do you like sports? He's like, hey, not so much. He's like, I love sports. You know, do you like this? No, I don't like that. You know, so you see this sort of adolescent back and forth. But then you do see Paul say to him at one point about his friend, that guy's a douche, ma'am. And he hasn't had no one in his family who's been able to say that. So Paul, even though he is not necessarily the figure that Laser wanted, is able to give him a masculine perspective, the masculine perspective he's looking for. Maybe not, maybe, maybe not what Laser expects, but something else that he's looking for. However, of course, at the end of the movie, it's complicated because Laser's let down by it. So you see Paul once again trying to make contact, but Laser rejecting him. Because he has, Laser has looked outside his family for, for someone, you know, like that, and then found out that he doesn't, you know, his, his family ended up being kind of, you know, like I said, you know, Paul did not put in the time, those moms put in the time. I think it's a very complicated issue, and you're not going to be able to solve, you know, family problems or talk about everybody's family within the model of this. I mean, this is a, this is a movie, and it's a movie that explores themes about family and parenting and, and growing up, and, um, but, but by no means is it a blueprint for, for anything. It's, you know, it's a movie. Eh, Maria Pia Fusco, Repubblica. Eh, a proposito delle differenze fra eh, Stati Uniti e Italia, noi qui abbiamo un premier che esattamente questa mattina ha detto che è meglio guardare le donne che essere gay, è meglio qualunque altra cosa che essere gay. Potrebbe darci una definizione di un personaggio di questo genere? and archaic and idiotic, frankly. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we live in a time when it's, becoming, it's become very clear that, that sexual orientation is about biology. So, we, you know, we are who we are. I mean, I used to say that about my kids, that I feel like my kids were present from the minute they were born. You know, they're there, we're all there. So to refute that, to say that there's something wrong with homosexuality when, when there's a historical perspective for it, when there have been many great people and thinkers and, and whatever you know, who've been gay, certainly currently it's, you know, like I said, where there's studies, gay families where everybody's happy and healthy and, and everything you want your children to be. So it is, it's archaic, it's unfortunate, and it's embarrassing when people continue to perpetrate those untruths. Sono Giulia Virsta della Romania. Uh, volevo chiederti, sei una bellissima cinquantenne, una bellissima donna cinquantenne, oltre che attrice. Vorrei che ci parlassi un 49, po'. 49, not 50. Yeah. <laughs> Vorrei che ci parlassi un po' dei eventuali problemi di un'attrice oltre quarantenne uh, in America. E un po' di Julian Moore, mamma, moglie e anche attrice. Grazie. That's a big question. I don't know where to start. I mean, first I'll address the age question because honestly, because I started, you know, I got the question earlier about what changed my career and I said these three films came out at the same time. And that, when they came out, I think I was 32 or 31 or 32, I can't remember when they all came out, but um, because of that, all anybody's asked me about my entire career is when my career is going to be over. <laughs> so, I don't know, you know, I mean, you can always, like that age question comes up again and again and again. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what to say, you know, to it. I honestly think that we kind of make it, we, by, by continually hammering this issue of age in the media, we make it much worse. I mean, I, mean, um, I think there, there are plenty of examples of, of people who work. Like I said, for example, my career didn't even start until I was 30, my film career, anyway. So, yeah, so I don't, I don't really know. I mean, in terms of the mother-actress parenting thing, I feel like I'm very, very lucky to have the opportunity to have a job and have a family. 
And that's what we are all aiming for, you know. I mean, Troy says you need love and work, you need the both. And, and to be fortunate enough to have, have both um, is, is just incredible. And I continue to be kind of great, you know, grateful every day. And it's something that I don't, I don't take for granted, you know, um, that I have a, a wonderful family and that I have work that I enjoy. Hello, Julian. It's Alexander Lizardos from National Greek Television. Uh, Julian, uh, you're a straight woman, but you have portrayed uh, a lot of gay-friendly characters in your career. And I think that you would be the ideal person to explain us in your own way. Uh, what can society do uh, to change the standards that they do exist about straight and gays? And uh, also a very small uh, extra question. If you were in a similar situation, would you like your kids to know who, who's, who is really the, the real father? Thank you so much. Okay, I mean, in terms of the in terms of the first question, I think you know it's we're so as as human beings we love to categorize everything. You know, we like to put things in 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 order to help us understand them. We say, oh, this is this way, this is this way, this is this way. And the one thing that we can do is be less divisive about everything. Be less divisive about about race, about religion, about sexuality, about gender, about all of those things. If we, you know, the more we're able to see one another as human beings without those kind of definitions, I think the better off we'll be. And in, and in terms of 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 expanding our tolerance, what they've, what they've shown is that basically it's exposure. It's exposure and education. The more people learn about um, people that they believe are different, the less they will think they're different. The more you know that someone, that, that your coworker, or your neighbor, or your cousin is gay, the more you'll go, oh, well, that's not, you know, that's, that's not different at all. Um, what was the other question? <laughs> If you were oh, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I think it's very personal. Um, I think most people these days, when they um, they use donors, uh, op opt for an, you know, an, an option for the child to know when they're 18. I think, um, I think it's very, it's very, very individual. It would be difficult for me. I can't, I can't say what I would do because I'm not in that situation. So in a sense, it's not fair. I think you really have to kind of look at your family and, and, and know what you want for them and, you know, decide that way. Hi, um, this is Isabella Rossello from The Idea Magazine, New York. And uh, just one question. Uh, I was in Holland um, in a primary school last year. And uh, before uh, to begin the lesson, the teacher asked uh, the children, um, okay, who has two fathers? Hands up. Who has two mothers? Hands up. Who has a mother and father and so on? And the children were very, very happy, no problems, no. Do you think could be the future of this? Thanks. Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. I mean, there's this game that we have, I don't know if you have in Italy, called the Game of Life. Do you have that game? Where you put little people in a car and you go around a board, and on the game, you stop and you get married, and then you stop and have babies, and you go to college, you get a job, blah, blah, blah. And I play that with my kids. And from the time they were very little, they would say, who do I want to marry, a girl or a boy? And they would just sort of decide. And it was not an issue for them, because their reality is that they see plenty of two, you know, female couples, plenty of male couples, plenty of male-female couples. For them, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, like I said, it's, it's about exposure, it's about education, it's, it's about, uh, um, yeah, just, it's, it's generational, I think, often. So, for them, I think that, that is what the future is. Ah, buongiorno, Alessandro Bizzotto, Fusi Orari. Eh, ho letto tempo fa, lei ha dichiarato più volte che non ama eh, provare eh, sul set, che preferisce girare senza provare molto. Quindi, volevo chiederle, nel lavoro eh, su questo set con squadra di attori anche di generazioni diverse, con esperienze diverse, come avete lavorato e come avete adattato i vostri metodi eh, l'uno all'altro, insomma. Grazie e complimenti. Thank you. I mean, it's always challenging because everybody in a set is going to have a different way of working. It really is about what you're comfortable with. And for me, I like to be very, very familiar with my words. I like to know what the shots are. Like, I go in and take a look at the shot list and talk about that. And then I like to just do it. Um, some people 
like to rehearse, in which case you, you absolutely, you know, you have to let them have their, their process, do what they want. You know, on this movie, we had so little time that it was almost a blur. I mean, all the stuff with Mark, for example, that I did in my storyline was shot in three days. So that whole section was just like, uh, we barely remember it. So, so, you know, we would just set up and, and, and go. But I do think that you, you have to let everybody work the way they want to work. And that's the beauty of a great director, is that when they're working with a large cast, they're able to ascertain what people need. Um, I think Lisa has said in some interviews that you know she had long, lengthy conversations with Annette before before they um, before they began because, Lisa, because Annette likes to talk about character, and I don't. I barely spoke to Lisa, <laughs> so you know. But she let she let it happen. She let it be that way. I mean, and that's just and that's the way it worked out. Bene, ringraziamo tantissimo,